a young friend of mine, also a priest, said to me recently that, unlike me, he had never used the Book of Common Prayer of 1662 and had never become familiar with any of its distinctive prayers. As I prepared to celebrate Ash Wednesday this year, that most solemn of penitential days, I found myself calling to mind one of that prayer book's most distinctive prayers, originally one, one originally composed by Archbishop Thomas Cramner for the 1548 uh, edition of the prayer book. It was, said, it was to be said by the congregation immediately before receiving Holy Communion. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table. But thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. As a younger Christian, I and others of my generation were perhaps a little uncomfortable with the wording of this prayer. And while I was a seminarian in training for ordination, we sometimes refer to it as the, the prayer of humble mumble. But I rather think that as bumptious young candidates for the priesthood, we were rather too ready to stress affirmation and hope love, joy and peace at the expense of acknowledging our continuing need for repentance and of recognising our mortal frailty. In some respects, it is a longer version of the prayer we at St Stephen's always repeat as we prepare to approach the altar. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. And these words of the Missal uh, themselves echo the words of the centurion to Jesus in Matthew chapter 8 verse 8. And so we, ca we come on the first and most solemn penitential day, Ash Wednesday, to inaugurate the Lenten fast. We do not presume to trust in our own righteousness, but in his manifold and great mercy. We know that of ourselves we can do nothing. So we come to this, this altar and in church in the spirit of the Canaanite woman in Matthew 15, who came to the Lord asking for healing for her daughter and pleaded before Jesus, yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table, but we are not given crumbs. We are given a full meal and not just any meal. At the altar, we receive our Lord in himself, in the sacrament of his body and blood. So too, on Ash Wednesday, that special and solemn day, the ash received on each person's forehead is a sign and token of our mortal frailty and of our continuing need for divine grace. Not for nothing is Lent spoken of, not only as a season of repentance and self-denial, but as a season of grace, for self-denial is more than a matter of giving up on this or that. Indeed, giving up on anything is pointless unless it is centred on our relationship to Christ himself. But centred how? In his poem of 1935, Bernd Norton, a poem I've mentioned uh, before, I think, T.S. Eliot imagines a bird speaking to the poet figure much as might an angel speak to us. Go, 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 said the bird. Humankind cannot bear very much reality. Time past and time future, what might have been and what has been point to one end, which is always present at the still point of the turning world. Enigmatic words, I know, indeed, uh, all four of the four quartets, of which this is the first, are quite difficult to get one's head around, but worth staying with. All too often, we are like Simon Peter, who rebuked Christ when Jesus foretold his own suffering and death. Like Simon Peter, 
we sometimes cannot bear very much reality. We take fright, flight into wishful thinking. We take refuge in distraction. What is the remedy? I expect you're aware of the new vogue, or the recent vogue for mindfulness training. There may well be something to be said for it in a clinical context, for example, perhaps as part of treatment for anxiety and depression. And it is now in use, I gather, in some prisons, partly to wean prisoners off illegal drugs. People associated sometimes with Buddhist traditions, but it's there in our own tradition also. In his treatise entitled On Abandonment to Divine Providence, the 18th century Jesuit, Jean-Pierre de Caussade, wrote of the sacrament of the present moment. This idea of living in the now. If we think of, we, we, if we think of Lent as a season of mindfulness, uh, of, recollec of recollection, as well as a preparation for what is to come, a journeying towards Holy Week and Easter, we should be on the right track. Bernd Norton is the first of Eliot's intensely mystical four quartets. It speaks of the intersection of time and eternity, as do the, uh, the other three. In Little Gidding, for example, Eliot writes, here he, he, the intersection of the timeless moment is England and nowhere, never and always. Little Gidding was the home of a small Anglican religious community, community established in 1626 by Nicholas Ferrer, together with two of his siblings and their extended families. King Charles I visited Little Gidding no less than three times. I have gone there just the once so far. In the community chapel that is still there, one really does have a sense of that intersection of time and eternity. Well, there are, we are told, many such places, if one but knew where to find them, where the veil that separates us from heaven is vanishingly thin. There are many such encounters of this kind that figure in the Old and New Testaments. Some of these are associated with mountains and high places. We can think of Moses on Mount Sinai, of Jesus and those with him at his transfiguration, or the vision in Isaiah 2 of a future mountain of the house of the Lord, which we are to ascend there to find him, or indeed in Isaiah's own vision in the historical temple itself in Isaiah 6. For, of course, the temple is on a, a, a mountain, the Temple Mount. But such encounter can be anywhere, such as that which St Paul experienced when he was still called Saul, and an encounter with the risen Christ on the Damascus Road in Acts chapter 6. Yet mountains were long regarded as places of encounter with the divine. In the time of the judges, there were hill shrines. This is before the temple was established in Jerusalem. These were the holy places one went to, to worship the one true God. One such was at Gerizim, Mount Gerizim, which became and still is the Samaritan's holy mountain. The Ark of the Covenant was at one time housed at a hill sanctuary, of the hill sanctuary of Shiloh. The testing of Abraham in Genesis 22 took place on Mount Moriah. Yet for Abraham himself, perhaps the veil was at its thinnest, not on a mountain top, but by the Oaks of Mamre, which are or were north of Hebron, where God appears to him in the guise of three strangers who accept hospitality from him and repeat the divine promise that Sarah shall be a mother of nations. That's in Genesis chapter 17. So too, in this Lent and beyond it, we are to respond as Abraham did to the three strangers, though not this time by offering hospitality to strangers, but by accepting it from a very special friend, accepting that friend's Eucharistic promise in faith. So that to the words, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, we say, Amen. 
and this is our yes to him our acceptance of him at an intersection of the timeless moment at the altar and so too when we receive the ashes acknowledging our mortal frailty and our need of christ and his grace we come to a fresh understanding perhaps that he is himself for us the still point of the turning world <laughs>